Hello again, my name is Sufyan Bandaoud and I'm the business development manager for the Precision Analog team here at TI Silicon Valley. We've been talking about how to get the most out of your SAR ADC design, which is part of the TIPD, in other words, TI Precision Design. That can be found at ti.com forward slash precision designs. This is an extensive set of reference designs with extensive documentation ranging from certification, prototyping, validation, calculations, theoretical, and otherwise. And I think we left off last time talking about the input driver, and we detailed some of the calculations that go along with that, meaning the input driver for the SAR ADC, namely the ADS8881. Just as a reminder, that's a one mega sample per second, 18-bit SAR ADC from TI. That's the latest. And we were talking about designing essentially the optimum signal chain with respect to that, <coughs> excuse me, lowest noise and lowest distortion. So we picked out of the four designs that we had, the lowest noise and lowest distortion, and that is the goal. So we're going to continue on with this last segment, which talks about the reference buffer. So essentially, it's going to be about the choice of the buffer, the DC precision, as well as the AC performance. Um, if you remember what we mentioned earlier, uh, I think it was segment one or two, we said that we needed low output impedance over a wide frequency range. Well, the output impedance, by that I mean the open loop output impedance. And I also mentioned that in order to get that, you really ought to be looking at a high speed amplifier. And high speed, again, take that with a grain of salt. I'm not necessarily talking about 300 megahertz or gigahertz range, but I'm talking in essence over 50 megahertz of gain bandwidth product. So with that said, having that in mind, we then go to the OPA350, which happens to be just that, over 50 megahertz. And it does fairly well AC-wise. The problem is it lacks the DC precision. There's another problem with that. Not surprisingly, it consumes 5 milliamps of current. So we're well in excess of that goal that we set forth at the beginning of the design. So 5 milliamps is not going to cut it. Furthermore, it doesn't have the precision. So what do we need here? If we go to the precision, we lack the AC performance, vice versa. If we pick the AC performance, we lack the DC precision. And that's what something clever comes in handy called the composite amplifier. This is a well-known topology, uh, very well-known in the industry. People do this all the time. But you got to be careful when you do this. One of the choices here is to pick basically a precision amplifier along with a high-speed amplifier, namely the OPA333, in this case, with the THS4281. And the idea here is to get the best of both worlds. And what I mean is, on the one hand, the OPA333 gives you the low power consumption, and it gives you the best available precision. So you can achieve that with the OPA333. And you say, wait a minute, how does the high-speed amplifier, the 4281, comes in? with the precision of the OPA333. They don't compare. They don't. You're right. However, because of the nature of the topology, in other words, because I insert the THS4281 into the feedback loop, all right, the global feedback as opposed to local feedback of that of the OPA333, it really knows the DC errors of that THS4281. So you get the benefits of both worlds, and that's what I mean. On the one hand, you get the AC precision of the high speed, namely the THS4281. On the other hand, you get the benefits of the DC precision, namely the VOS and the drift of the 333, along with the low power. So combined, this gives you well below 800 microamps of power consumption. Let's analyze this a little bit further. So if I take that same circuit and I just say at DC, this is really what it becomes. It becomes this picture up on your screen. Okay, so in other words, the OPA333 now is correcting the errors induced by the THS4281, all right, because it's a chopper. So anything it's going to see at its input, it's going to basically get rid of it, okay? It's a chopper stabilized amplifier, zero drift, otherwise known as zero drift. Some people also refer to it as an auto zero, but that's essentially what it does. Gives you 25 microvolts of offset and very, very low drift in double digits nanovolts per degree Celsius. Then you go to the AC performance. All right, from an AC standpoint, this is really what it looks like. All right, so you short basically, you open the capacitors, and that's your circuit. Your new circuit looks like this. At AC, the TH buffer uh, dominates essentially. So the OPA output provides good regulation against large 
high frequency, low transients, and then you get the benefit of the speed of the, in other words, the AC performance from the THS4281. So that's really the simple way of looking at it. Now we go on to filtering again. And in this case, we chose a snubber network, or we choose a snubber network. What is that? It's basically an RC filter, much of what we talked about earlier, except for a major difference. In this case, that R, in other words, the resistor, is really not in series with the output. And there's a reason for that. This snubber network will maintain the dynamic range. How so? Because it doesn't degrade the output swing quite drastically, as does the RC filter that we saw earlier in the slides, or, or in the uh, segment, the previous segment, that is. So it's good in such a way that it maintains the stability. It gives you really adequate step response, in other words, settling time. And number three, it maintains the dynamic range, all right? Now, of course, the, the, the difficult task here is to find those RC values in such a way to maintain uh, uh, basically enough bandwidth for your drive. So this is really a matter of going through the task and the exercise of simulation. And we simulate thanks to our SPICE capabilities and models. We use Tina SPICE, which is a, an online tool or offline tool for that matter that is provided to you, complimentary, so free, free of charge. You could use it. And, uh, and, and of course, all the SPICE models are in there, including that of the new parts that I've been talking about, OPA333, the 350, everything is in there. So when you simulate the circuit, as shown in the picture on your screen, you get two things. You get the value that gives you the best up or the optimum response time, in other words, the selling time. In this case, roughly around 600 nanoseconds or thereabouts, so well below a microsecond, which was basically the design goal. We wanted to keep it below a microsecond, so we actually achieved that with the value of um, about 250 milliohms for the R, for the resistor value, all right? That will give me also a phase margin just below, just shy of 60 degrees, so right around 56, 57 degrees or so, which is more than enough, it's plenty, it does what I want it to do, and I'm at peace of mind in terms of knowing that my circuit is functional and it's also stable. Now for the noise simulation, much of what we did earlier is really replicated here it's essentially really the same thing, except this time we're talking about the reference driver as opposed to the input driver into the ADC. So we do the same thing, and we know the bandwidth of the THS4281, uh, that's 95 megahertz. We simulate, we get about 35 microvolts, just about 35 microvolts, RMS that is, of output noise. That's by means of Tina Spice simulation that is. We then build it and bench test it, and keep, keep in mind, the SPICE models are oftentimes conservative, so they may not tie, uh, uh, tie in exactly, they may not dial in exactly with the expectations, so that's why it's a good practice to not only simulate, but also take it to the bench and verify or double check your measurements or, or your simulation results. As far as PCB layout, standard guidelines really in this particular case, you want to minimize the length of the traces supplying the ADC reference input. You want to also minimize any kind of parasitic inductance. Uh, that can cause instability, settling issues, um, EMI, interference, that is. You want to keep the components close together as much as you can help it and close to the ADC as much as possible. You want to keep the traces of differential signals as symmetrical as possible. This will definitely help you minimize the common mode errors, which could be a big deal. We're going differentially into the ADC. As far as the system dynamic performance, let's analyze this and how we did with respect to this design. Uh, keep in mind, this was a 100 kilohertz sinusoidal signal. And we get 110 dB. So we're going to see how we did compared to the goals that we set forth right at the beginning of the module, or uh, segment number one. And then the summary of the system performance. So now that we've cranked through the math, we've, we've, we diligently did our homework in terms of input driver, reference driver, snubber network, filtering schemes, the ADC input uh, sam uh, sampling capacitor, acquisition time, et cetera, et cetera. We went through the whole thing and the entire process. We now need to double check, make sure that we haven't failed in the process of achieving our goals. So we set the goals for THD to be 110 dB. We came in at 110 dB. 
We set a goal for SNR to be about 98 dB. We came in a little better at 98.7. We set a goal for INL to be within 1.5 LSB. And sure enough, we came in at well below 1.5 LSB. And then for the total power consumption, we set a goal forth to beat 40 milliwatts. And sure enough, we came in at 39.4 milliwatts, just below 40 milliwatts. That's acceptable and well, well within our boundaries. I want to thank you very much for joining me in these segments. I hope to see you soon. I certainly hope this was useful to you. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, please do feel free to email me at sufian.bandaud at ti.com or give me a ring. I'll be happy to chat with you. My phone number is 408-702-0311. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time.